Good evening, everyone. Welcome to St. Michael's for our Treasury of Prayer series. This is an original series uh, here started at uh, our parish back in October when a parishioner over the summer said, you know, there are so many different forms of prayer out there in the rich Catholic tradition. I'd like to learn more of them. Could we have something like that? And so we started it um, back in the fall. Uh, we took a little break uh, for Lent and had specific um, prayer and worship experiences um, for the Lenten season, but it's exciting to come back uh, to this series and look at a, a very unique form of prayer tonight. Since we started, we've looked at some of the official liturgies of the church, such as the Mass itself, uh, the Liturgy of the Hours. We looked at musical prayer with the prayer that comes out of a Taizé community in Taizé, France. And we looked at centering prayer, a form of contemplative silent prayer. Uh, but tonight we have a really unique prayer, as our presenter called it, or, or a bit of an unknown gem, a method from an actual saint, um, Saint Claire of Assisi, a great saint. Oftentimes, I think we know Claire as a great companion and intimate friend of St. Francis of Assisi, but she is so much more than just a friend of a saint. She's a great saint herself, a mystic, a contemplative, I think you could argue a theologian, um, and she has a specific form of contemplation that uh, Fran Gicko is going to uh, lead us in this evening to explain what it's all about, and then actually guide us through it. Uh, Fran is a prisoner here at St. Michael's. We're very blessed to have her here. She's also a third order secular Franciscan, um, a fellow secular Franciscan. I wore my best Franciscan brown for you tonight, Fran. Um, <laughs> since my children have destroyed all my towel crosses, I have oh, to no. rely on the color brown. Well, they're little. Um, so. Fran has actually written about this prayer method. Um, she's given this talk to the National Chapter of Secular Franciscans, as well as her own uh, fraternity, which I believe we're welcoming some uh, of her members tonight. So thank you for, for joining us. Uh, and she's going to be giving it at an upcoming conference too. So we are so fortunate to have her here tonight uh, to lead us in this form of prayer. With that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Fran. Okay, thank you. Good day. Can you hear me? I'm not used to this. A little bit louder? A little closer. Is that better? Uh, maybe I should use the microphone. Okay. Why don't we start with one of my favorite prayers, which is the prayer before the crucifix, by St. Francis of Assisi, of course. Most high, glorious God, enlighten the darkness of my heart and give me, Lord, true faith, certain hope, and perfect charity, sense and knowledge that I may carry out your holy and true command. Amen. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to um, just give you a little bit of background of St. Clair. Um, I can't go into any depth because I don't have the time, but that's all right. Uh, I'm going to briefly describe her way of contemplation, and then we'll have a chance to actually practice it as I go through a guided meditation with you. And then there'll be time for questions and answers. And then um, hopefully I, we can pray the blessing of St. Clair at the end. Okay. okay, how many people have seen statues or pictures of St. Clair? Okay, did you see her with a ciborium? Holding on to a ciborium? Well, that's historically inaccurate. Okay. Because at the time, in the medieval time where she lived, there were no ciboriums. They kept the Blessed Sacrament into a box. Okay, and the w statues that you see with her holding a box that looks like a lantern are actually more historically accurate. You'll also see her holding a lily, and that's because of her virginity. 
okay? And you'll see her in a poor Claire habit, a brown, simple tunic, cinctured with a rope, okay? And a black veil. And that pretty much has been the habit for the poor Claire's forever. And if you ever visit the, one, the poor Claire nuns in Andover, you'll see just a shortened form of that. But it's the same habit that they've used since Claire time. Okay. We're lucky that we have two poor Claire uh, monasteries in this area. One in Jamaica Plain, which was the um, origin of the Port Clare Monastery from Lowell. And then it turned into Andover. Okay. So we're lucky. The Port Clares are an enclosed, cloistered, contemplative order. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is because at the time there were no active sisterhood in the medieval times. It was either be cloistered or not join a religious order for women. Okay. Um, as you know, St. Clair was a contemporary and a very close friend of St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, and she was the beginning of the first feminine expression of the Franciscan movement. She was born in Assisi. No surprise there. In 1193 or 94, they're not sure of the date. Um, her name, Chiara, in Italian, um, means light, bright, or clearness. Okay, And she was born to a minor noble family. So that meant that she was pretty much almost in cloistered from the beginning of her life and stayed within the family compound the whole time. But she was educated. She knew how to write and read, and she was being primed to be a great marital asset for the family. Their plan was that St. Clair would go and marry someone and there'd be an alliance between another powerful family and Assisi. St. Clair had another idea, though. She heard St. Francis of Assisi, we're not sure exactly when, preach. And her heart just gravitated towards his words and his ideas. So she decided she was going to join him. In order to do that, she had to give away all of her dowry, okay, all of her bill, all of her um, titles or whatever. And she literally escaped from her family's home in the dark of night to meet St. Francis in Rivo Torto. And she was greeted with candles and escorted to San Damiano where they tonsured her, where they cut off her hair so that she became known as part of the church and gave her her habit. So when she joined St. Francis, this is Franciscan movement, she became penniless. St. Francis, for her protection, gave her sanctuary and arranged for her to have sanctuary in a Benedictine monastery that just happened to have papal privilege. So if anyone tried to do much of anything with St. Clair, they'd be excommunicated. So she hid there, but her family came after her, trying to convince her to leave, but they weren't successful, as you can see. Okay. She eventually moved over to San Damiano, and her sisters, people who were attracted to her message, came to be known as the poor ladies of San Damiano, and then lady, later were learned, known as the poor Clares. They attracted many vocations because of her affiliation with St. Francis and her message of poverty. Since she lived 27 years after St. Francis, she was attributed to having, um, making sure that the 
Franciscan charism was solidified because the brothers would come and visit St. Clair and ask questions for her and say, okay, wh what do you think St. Francis would do? Or, okay, re remind me what he was going at for this. She died in San Damiano after a long period of illness in 1253. Now, there were three things that really mattered a lot for St. Clair. And one was what she called the privilege of poverty. Okay? She saw that the crucified Christ was poor. He came down and was in, born in a uh, barn, in essence. Our almighty God came down as a human person, one of his creatures. So she saw the poverty of Christ, and then he became crucified for our sake. How she brought that into her order was that the privilege of poverty meant having nothing of one's own. So people coming into the order didn't need a dowry, which was common at the time. Their uh, monasteries did not accept endowments or gifts of land or goats or orchards in order to live off of. They, and St. Clair wanted to just live on God's charity, on whatever came, alms that came in the door. They worked, but they worked to give it away, to have something to give to charity. They didn't keep it. Anything that they didn't need that moment or to eat, they gave away. She developed this form of life, which is commonly called a rule, to help govern her monasteries. And this was also a little out of the ordinary for the time, because a lot of the monasteries had wealth, they had holdings, they had a division of choir nuns, and then the lay serving sisters. Okay, the choir nuns were the people from nobility, who came from money. So instead of being able to find someone to marry, their families would install a woman into a monastery to pray for them. But they would give the, her servants to bring to the monastery. They would give her orchards. They would give them farm animals. They would give them everything they needed so that their person, their, their kinswoman, would be taken care of. Now, this was something very difficult for the church hierarchy to accept that St. Clair only wanted to depend on the alms that might come in through the door because they felt that they needed to make sure that these women wouldn't starve to death. And there were times where their pantry was pretty meager, okay? But St. Clair was adamant that she wanted the privilege of poverty. And it comes down even to our poor Clares too, okay? They depend on alms for their sustenance. She also wanted her sisters to have more say in the monastery. So instead of an appointed abbess for a life term, St. Clair wanted an elected, elected abbess with term limits, just like any kind of election, but she was beyond before her time. And all well, the other sisters also voted in newcomers, people coming in and people being professed. Okay, that was different. 
St. Clair for a long time tried to get her rule approved, her form of life approved. But there was one obstacle or another. She and her sisters had to live under the Benedictine rule for many, many years. And it was only two days before her death that they relented and approved her rule of life. And so two days when she was on her deathbed, they delivered the rule of life that St. Clair wrote, the first woman to ever write her own rule of life. Now, the other things that um, you will hear about tonight will be her letters to Agnes of Pride. Agnes was a noble woman. She was the daughter of the king of Bohemia. And she had a monastery in Prague. But she was very curious about St. Clair and the Franciscan movement because she heard about it. And she wrote to St. Clair asking questions. And we don't have her letters, but we do have the responses that St. Clair made to her. And the first three letters were written pretty close together. They were written between 1233 and 1238. And she outlines the four major um, steps in her way of prayer. Ten years later, she wrote her last letter that we have. She might have written more, who knows. But the fourth letter was written 10 years later. And there, because of Claire's spirituality has deepened, she started talking about using a mirror as a reflection of the poor crucified Christ. You'll see her influence of being a medieval woman. She'll talk very flowerly when I use her, her words. And she'll describe her relationship with the crucified Christ as a bride and a spouse. Okay? And she also talks about using that mirror. Now, medieval mirrors are not like the mirrors we have now. They were usually just polished metal. Okay? And they were pretty rustic. They were wavy, they were pitted, they were kind of cloudy. Um, it was hard to see, really see an image. And I think St. Clair thought of that to try and see the image of Christ. Because we can never see a clear image of Christ because of the mystery. So the four movements that Clair talked about is gazing, and using the mirror image as a reflection is part of that gazing. And I'll go into it a little bit. See, when we do the directed, um, the guided meditation, how, it, how it's used. Um, and also paying, it, paying attention to what's happening. The second is consider, and this is all in your little pamphlet. The third is to contemplate. And the fourth is as you imitate. Because as you're filled with Jesus Christ through this prayer form, you always want to have it overflow and come out and imitate what, who you've met in your contemplation. So gazing is to draw, being drawn into the object you see with your heart and to gaze deeply with compassion and love. She describes Christ as the mirror. He looks, you look at him, and he looks at you. And there's a reflection going back between the mirror of Christ and yourself. And you should attend and end Think about what you see. 
Sometimes you can use gazing, if you'd like, from a scripture passage. So you can imagine what you're hearing in scripture and gaze upon the people and the actions in that scripture. Consider St. Clair talks about is an understanding of what you see and a context. So it's a, a deeper appreciation for the meaning of what behind you're seeing. And she wants you to respond and to savor that. Don't go, just go zipping along, but to stay with it and dwell with it. And of course, contemplate is to rest with the Lord. Wordless, imageless, attending and just being available. When we go through this guided meditation, I'm going to have to shorten that period than I, what I usually do. So it's only going to be three minutes, which is hardly enough to really get into it. But I have time limits here, so this is more, take it as a instruction. And then, as you emerge from this period of contemplation, you remember what has occurred, and you desire to imitate the Christ you met, and taste the sweetness that God had reserved for you. So now, I'm going to go into the guided meditation. I'm going to sit down. And, oops, and I ask um, for you to find a comfortable seat, comfortable way of sitting. I will be using some of St. Clair's actual words, so you'll get a taste of her words as a medieval woman. And we'll be meditating on the crucifix that you see right up there, because that was a favorite object for St. Clair to meditate upon. And so I want you to quiet yourself, clear your mind, and ask God to help you put your, aside your concerns for today. Make your intention to spend this time with Jesus. Claire instructs us on her way of prayer in her second letter to Agnes of Prague when she says, Most noble queen, gaze, consider, contemplate, desiring to imitate your spouse. To gaze is not simply to see. Rather, gaze is to be drawn into the object one sees with affection and compassion. Gaze at the crucifix. See Jesus on the cross with your heart in compassion and love. Look at his face. See his wounds, his crown. his burial shroud. And love him.
gazing is also reflecting. When we gaze upon the mirror of Christ, we look at him, and he looks at us. We see ourselves in the mirror. We see a reflection of who we are in Christ, the one who draws us closer to himself. God sees me, whom he created. He delights in me. God beholds. I think it's quite something else to realize that God thinks I'm glorious. I'm one of his creation. Claire uses the word speculare, which is filled with the echoes of looking in a mirror, into a speculum, in two ways. The meaning of a mirror and the meaning of example. Christ, the mirror, Christ, the example. Claire says, at the border of the mirror, that is the poverty of him who was placed in a manger and wrapped in swaddling clothes. Reflect at the surface of the mirror the holy humility, at least the blessed poverty. And finally, con contemplate the depths of this same mirror, the ineffable charity that he chose to suffer on the tree of the cross and to die there a most shameful death. Claire instructs us, gaze into this mirror every, every day and constantly see your own face reflected in it. So may you always catch fire more and more strongly from his burning love. Our lives should reflect his life in us as a mirror as we carry him in our hearts. He is our example. Claire goes on to urge us to pay attention to both our response and the insights we receive. So let us respond to him. Attendere, she tells us. Attend, we are to be alert to the insights of our reflection and to remember them and savor them. As we move into consider, it means to look at something and to see it as a whole and see it in its context. Both my context, my personal context, and that of the incarnate word, Christ.
the focus shifts more and more from ourselves at prayer to Christ at prayer in us. And beyond that, to the goal of the whole enterprise, the inner dynamic of the Trinity, the flow of love between Father, Son, and Spirit. We get love to live love, and at the end, return to love. John 14, 17 says, You know him, for he dwells within you and will be in you. Our warm response to love incarnate leads to, in the words of St. Clair, O oh, marvelous humility, O oh, astonishing poverty, the king of angels, the lord of heaven and earth, is laid in a manger. Our God has become man and then died for us. As your thoughts slow, enter into the resting with the Lord and contemplate. Wordless, imageless, attending, being available. Whose tenderness touches, whose contemplation refreshes, whose kindness overflows, whose delight overwhelms. The love which cannot be put into words, we no longer are trying to understand as we were when reflecting. Now we are face to face with the mystery, and above all, the holiness. As we slowly emerge from this period of quiet, St. Clair instructs us to remember what has occurred during this prayer time and desire to imitate your beloved. Abide in me and I in ye, you. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. John 15, 4 to 5. 
we imitate because there is a spiritual birth of Christ in our lives. Our goal of prayer is bringing Christ to birth. That is a union in love with God that conceives the word, carries the word, gives birth to the word, and then is mirrored in the word. St. Clair says, we are spouses when the faithful soul is united by the Holy Spirit to our Lord Jesus Christ. We are brothers, moreover, when we do the will of his Father who is in heaven. Mothers, when we carry him in our heart and body through love and a pure and sincere conscience and give birth to him through a holy activity which must shine before others by example. And that was Francis's words. As you desire to imitate, may you therefore be inflamed ever more strongly with the fire of love as you further contemplate his ineffable delights, riches, and perpetual honors. And sighing, may you cry out from the great desire and love of your heart, draw me after you. Let us run in the fragrance of your perfumes, O heavenly spouse. I will run and not tire until you bring me into the wine cellar, until your left hand is under my head and your right hand will embrace me happily. And St. Clair continues and urges us, place your mind before the mirror of eternity. Place your soul in the brilliance of glory. Place your heart in the figure of divine substance and through contemplation, transform your entire being into the Godhead itself. When we spend time with the Lord, we allow this transformation to happen. Amen. So, I hate to break this prayerful mood, but are there any questions? Yes. Yeah, you can use any object, any picture, anything. Yes, not just the crucified Christ, although um, Claire loved the crucified Christ on the cross, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. The question, did everyone hear his question? Okay, the question was whether we could use 
um, other objects for our objects or pictures or statues or imaginative kinds of meditations from scripture perhaps blessed mother You can use this method with anything, um, in essence. Um, I used it because of the beautiful crucifix here, and it was a favorite of St. Clair to meditate. She prayed this prayer, this medieval prayer, called um, the Five Wounds, the prayer of the Five Wounds of Jesus. And um, that was one of her favorite prayers to start. Any other questions? This is kind of a hard thing to, to get in a first go round with the idea of the image of the mirror reflecting back, you know, and um, paying attention to, to um, what's happening with, with your meditation or your contemplation. Um, I mean, there's elements of, I mean, needless to say, Claire was um, familiar with Lexio Divina. Um, she was c familiar with contemplative prayer from the Desert Fathers, you know. Um, now we could say, well, there's a little bit of Visio Divina in this too. Um, but, you know, um, this is how Claire saw it way back in the Middle Ages, in medieval time. Um, and I think what's also unique is that St. Clair, her purpose was the imitation part of it at the end. Um, that we just don't leave our contemplation and meditations there, okay? But that the whole object is, is to give birth to Christ in our lives. I gave you a very abbreviated version today because, <laughs> you know, um, we didn't have that much time and it's, it's new for a lot of people because um, I'm not sure whether there's too many people here who actually heard of it before. Um, you know, so, but the more that you use it, the more you're comfortable with it and the more you can make the transitions. Considering, yes. Right. And then you... Imitation. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it does. Yes, Father. Yeah. Well, yeah, um, she was bound by um, 
the medieval ideas of what women should be, you know, and they did not have the act of sisterhood at that point in time. Um, it came later. And so if you wanted to be a woman religious, you had to be cloistered, in essence. But she had always had this outward thing, too. Um, there are stories of St. Clair healing people when they came to the monastery. Um, you know, and so, um, and we get the feeling that her cloister was not quite as tight as some of the other orders, um, you know, but, but she was cloistered, and um, so it, it limited what she could do, um, you know, following Francis, unfortunately. But Francis, yeah, I mean, he, he preached by his actions, you know, and, and, but he spent a considerable amount of time in prayer. At one point in time, he was torn whether to be active or come back into a hermitage and just have a life of prayer. But he asked um, to um, St. Clair and um, one of his brothers um, what he should do, and they discerned that he was to stay active in the world rather than withdraw. So, yes? Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, her rule of life was depending on God for everything, you know, and at that time, you know, you had monasteries that were ransacked and pillaged, and the, the women were um, raped sometimes in some of these medieval monasteries and that's part of the reason why they were cloistered um, so the hierarchy really felt strongly that they should be women should be protected and that they were afraid that they would starve to death because people would not be giving them alms in the beginning the friars would go out and seek alms for the poor clares and you know um, they would actually bring home food for them and, um, and whatever they needed. But it, that wasn't always that way. You know, sometimes there were times when they didn't have enough bread for all the sisters in the, in the monastery. And there was a, a little miracle of the multiplication of the bread with St. Clair as well in her roles. And that's why... Um, on the Feast of St. Clair, the poor Clares give everyone who come to their transitus um, ceremony, which talks about the death of St. Clair, little rolls of bread. So, yes? I picked um, the poor Claire's brains um, when I wrote that little pamphlet up. Um, they've been wonderful with me, putting up with me, um, having me, you know, I, I ask them to go over things that I, I do um, because I'm not an expert of their way of life. They are. <laughs> so um, Sister Therese Marie has been very gracious in helping to make sure that I'm representing things right. So I, I thank her a lot and the, and the sisters over at Andover Monastery. So anything else? Okay, why don't I end with St. Clair's blessing, which you may not have heard. May Almighty God bless you. May look, he look upon you with the eyes of mercy and give you his peace. And may he pour forth his graces on you abundantly. And in heaven, may he place you among his saints.
Amen. And thank you so much for joining us tonight and sharing um, your deep knowledge of both Claire and, and her method of prayer. And thank you all for, for joining us. Um, actually, it's interesting that you spoke about Lexio Divina because that is um, our next uh, topic for um, the, the Treasury of Prayer uh, next month, but we don't have an exact date yet, so please stay tuned um, on our website, our, our Wednesday Warmer, our, our e-letter, as well as our Facebook page. And if there is a method of prayer out there that you would like to know more about, one that you've heard about, or even a, a type of prayer, um, please uh, let me know or, or one of our priests know, uh, so that we can see if that is something that we can uh, make part of this series. So so again, thank you so much, and we hope that your Easter season continues to be blessed, and maybe adding this form of prayer is, is one Easter blessing that, that we can do um, in this great 50 days. So thank you so much. Have a good night. <laughs>